Cool. We have some people on Zoom, people in the room. Okay, um, so I'll do a quick intro and then we'll get started. So our speaker today is a graduate student in Dr. Richard Fetzel's lab at Indiana University. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Science in Biology as well as a Bachelor of Engineering in Biotechnology before she started working in neuroscience during her master's at King's College in London. In London. Um, she's already pu published nine different papers spanning a pretty wide range of interesting topics. Um, but today she's going to speak to us about her work on variation and high amplitude events across the human lifespan. And yeah, uh, Young and Joe, whenever you're ready, go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and this opportunity to discuss some of our most recent work, which is kind of still in the works. And uh, yeah, uh, my name is Young and Joe, and you can call me Joe. Everyone in our lab calls me Joe. And uh, I'm doing my graduate studies at IU with Rick Betzel in the Brain Networks and Behavior Lab. And since this work is still in it's it is in its end stages, but it's still a work in progress and in writing. And so the questions and feedback suggestions are all very welcome today. And so I, I'm not sure if the uh, audience is very familiar with brain networks, and I would like to briefly introduce what brain networks are. But before we do so, it is also important to meet the parents. Graph theory and neuroscience. So uh, graph theory is a branch of mathematics that studies networks, which consists of vertices or nodes connected by edges. And neuroscience is the study of structure and function of the brain and the nervous system. So how do we connect these two fields? Um, I, I, if you can squint, squint your eyes, you can see the structural resemblance of graphs and neuronal connections. Right? I, I, I hope the audience can see this, um, the resemblance here. And uh, thus, the marriage between the two fields are quite intuitive. But why should we get them married? Uh, brain networks or network neuroscience is a branch of studies that views the brain as a network, focusing on its nodes and connections. Nodes can be. Uh, neuronal cells, they can be neuronal populations or cell assemblies, or uh, brain regions and areas. And edges can be synapses, uh, they can be activity or structure between populations or brain areas. And so nodes and edges in a brain network can be versatile and are in essence user-defined. While the brain can be investigated through the network science lens at various spatial, topological, and temporal scales, the analyses and results that I will share today scales largely at these scales. So in terms of spatial scales, I will focus on brain regions or areas. And on the topological scales, I will investigate global, mesoscale, and local um, scales of investigation. And on temporal scales, I will not only investigate in instantaneous um, uh, temporal scales, but also throughout the human lifespan. So that's a quite big gap there. And um, I'm pretty sure um, a lot of people have already uh, at least skimmed this paper, but in uh, this year, uh, Winding and colleagues uh, published in Science, uh, the entire synaptic connectome of the Drosophila larva brain, which consists of over 3,000 neurons and 548,000 synaptic sites. While we can process this data with the computer, our brains have trouble comprehending the results using uh, this data at this scale. So with the use of networks, we can reduce the dimensionality of the data in a meaningful and data-driven way to investigate the interactions between a reasonable number of elements. So uh, in this case, it would be clusters or modules. And modules refer to a group of nodes that are internally densely connected, but has externally sparse connections. So if you see the plot here, you can see the gray lines, which are dividing the clusters. 
And you can see how uh, the clusters here are close. There are more connections within the modules compared to the uh, between module connections. And also, you can see how the authors color coded neurons uh, based on their functionalities in figure A. And the neurons that have similar functionalities labeled with matching colors uh, are found in matching clusters across various uh, levels of clusters. And another property of network neuroscience or networks in general is the diversity of temporal, topological, and spatial scales of investigation. Uh, this is one of the appealing features of graph theoretical approaches and that the methods are largely universal to various spatial and temporal scales of investigation. Uh, for instance, we can apply the same modularity maximization to the neuronal synaptic connection data or even whole brain functional network data. And also the methodology is not limited to data modality. We can detect modules, rich clubs, or hubs in protein-protein interaction networks, in brain functional connections, and even human-to-human -human social interaction networks. And lastly, investigating the brain as a network allows topological investigations, allowing one to ask questions such as um, that are based on graph theory. Um, for instance, how do clique structures in brain networks change with aging or development? And cliques refer to, at, at least in networks, uh, to a group of nodes that are fully interconnected within themselves. So um, investigating the brain as a network can be appealing um, in various ways, but the, the, the things that I want to highlight here is that it can help reduce the data in a data-driven, meaningful way, so dimensionality, and allows data investigation at various scales, and allows the topological investigation of the data, so we can ask different questions. Oh, and also, if you have questions, uh, it is okay to stop me uh, whenever during the talk, because I always have trouble um, rem remembering my questions till the very end, and yeah. And so, hopefully, if you are already studying brain networks, awesome. If not, I hope this general introduction has drawn some interest, creating a basis for future research and collaborations, and yeah. And so uh, now, since we know a little bit about brain networks, we can now move on to more recent research. Uh, this isn't research done by us, but um, in 2010, Bharat Biswal and colleagues have discovered that fMRI collected during the resting state scan shows patterns of correlation between brain areas without the existence of an in-scanner task. As such, a conventional approach to creating uh, whole brain estimates of brain function using resting state fMRI data is to calculate the correlation of two nodes activation patterns across time. And uh, this creates a summary statistic, a single Pearson correlation coefficient of the activity of two brain areas, which can, can, be, which can be conceptualized as an edge in a brain network. With such functional brain networks, we can do interesting things such as find modules or groups of nodes that are internally densely connected but sparsely connected outside the group. Or we can detect hub nodes that have significantly greater connections than non-hub nodes, which may act as important regions of information relay across the brain network. And in 2020, Bernard Zamani, Esfalani, and colleagues uh, took the time series of fMRI data and created an edge time series by performing frame-wise multiplications of the nodal time series. So uh, in short, the process of creating edge time series is as follows. Uh, you take the nodal time series of uh, a node and uh, you can z-score them and perform a frame-wise multiplication from a pair of nodes, so it's two nodes, do a frame-wise multiplication, and repeat the step two across all node pairs, or edges, and across all frames. And that creates an edge time series uh, for from the uh, typical time series data that we normally use to create a functional connectivity matrix. 
And uh, so ETS can be considered as the snapshots of SC. It, it, this is how I like to approach um, the data in which each time point or the edge that constitutes this matrix is the, is the frame-wise multiplication value of the activation patterns between two nodes. And if we plot each time point across time, the whole rate ETS would look something like this. Is the video playing okay? So there was a black line in the middle here, and th these are what we uh, define as events. And we could see multiple of them in across a typical edge uh, time series data. And um, these are the time points at which the whole brain-wide co-fluctuation amplitudes are sig statistically significantly above a null model. And um, so I would like you to now re-see this, uh, this um, video. And basically, you can see how the whole brain kind of fires up at the time point of the black line. You can see how it how the entire brain just fires up. Now, so why are edge time series and their events that we just saw as the black line interesting? Um, for one, edge time series is an instantaneous and exact decomposition of functional connectivity. The approach is similar to that of a sliding window approach, but without having to make a decision of a window size or having to smooth out data within each time window. And more specifically, edge time series provides the time series of co-fluctuations per edge or between two nodes. Also, peak events have been found to contribute disproportionately more to functional connectivity than trough frames are more modular they synchronize during naturalistic movie watching data, provide enhanced subject identifiability, and can be clustered into template patterns or states. So uh, events in edge time series have interesting qualities and can be clustered into distinct patterns or states. But what we still haven't found out was whether these events actually change with age and are they related to structural connectivity, our estimate of the brain's physical connections? And can we use events for behavioral and phenotypic predictions? Were the questions that I had in mind and that I want to share with you today. Uh, so in order to test these questions, we use the NKI lifespan data set, which consists of subjects from ages four to their 80s. And after excluding subjects with high motion or uh, missing data, we ended up using subjects from ages 6 to 75. And as you can see, this is the uh, subject age distribution plot here. But there is an unequal distribution of samples across age groups. And thus, in all our analyses, uh, we sampled an equal number of subjects, uh, 20 subjects per age group, across seven age bins. Each age bin had a size of 10 years. And for example, age group one would include 20 random sampled, randomly sampled subjects uh, between the ages six to 15. And then we sampled an equal number of subjects for each age group, uh, for all age groups, uh, to prevent our results from being biased to a particular age group. Next, for each subject, we created edge time series by the frame-wise multiplication of nodal time series and detected the events. Next, uh, the event frames were collected from all subjects across all age groups upon the performed k-means clustering. And this process would simply categorize each column or the event uh, in this uh, matrix here. Uh, as either cluster one or cluster two. 
So each column would be labeled uh, in as the result of the k-means clustering as cluster one or cluster two, cluster two, cluster one, and so on and so forth. And all sampling and clustering processes were repeated for 108 iterations. And we could uh, classify uh, an event frame as either cluster one or cluster two. And so our first finding is that not all events are alike, or events have distinct patterns. Uh, some events look like C1 here, and some events resemble C2. Uh, here, we are displaying the result at k equals 2, since the clusters at k equals 2 were most similar across 100 iterations. And uh, yes, uh, so, and, and also we believe that uh, if we can explain the results in a simp simpler fashion, the better. And so for both cluster one and cluster two, um, they were much more significantly similar to uh, the static FC matrix than that of non-events. So here uh, the blue are NE for the non-event frames and uh, C1 and C2 were found to be more similar to the full FC matrix uh, than non-events. And also uh, the Cluster two events were found to be more similar to FC than C1. So we can think of events in largely two flavors, uh, C2, cluster two, which highly resembles typical functional connectivity, and C1 that captures events that are less resemblant of FC. And we can also see here that uh, the principal component of C2 largely uh, resembles uh, areas of the door, uh, the default mode network. Uh, so the def default mode network is labeled in pink here. And uh, you can see that the highly activated regions and the first principal component of, P uh, of cluster two largely overlaps with the DMN and the Schaefer Atlas. Uh, and compared to C2 in C1, the highlighted regions largely reside, reside in the somatomotor cortices. And next, we wanted to investigate whether these event patterns, C1 and C2, change with age. Here, we simply took all events corresponding to each age group, averaged them for each age group, and compared them to that of the youngest age group. Uh, which consists of subjects from ages six to 15. And thus, these results are simply subtraction matrices for each age group, subtracting the youngest age group from the age group of interest. And from the left to the right is ages 16 to 25. And on the far right is the age subtraction matrix from the oldest age group to the youngest. And just by visual inspection, we can see that events C1 and C2 incrementally differentiate from the first age group. And we also found that uh, the frequency of C2 increases, whereas C1 decreases with age. And this is speculation, but uh, we speculate that this may be due to the brain function becoming less divergent as instances of C1 that largely resemble typical FC, oh no, sorry, uh, become less divergent as uh, C1, which less resembles FC, uh, decrease and solidify uh, solidifying the uh, FC towards the more typical looking FC, while, um, oh, and uh, C2 that resembles FC tends to increase. And so in, in all, the com combined effect of C1 decreasing and C2 increasing uh, creates a FC to look consistently more like itself with age. And well, lastly, was, yes? Oh, I was wondering if I can ask a question, but I'll let you go through this result first because of my answer. Okay, yes. And sure. Uh, lastly, we tested whether the system level edge values correlate with age. And in both C1 and C2, the visual areas showed correlations with age. Um, and in C2, the results were also highly pronounced in the temporal parietal areas. Uh, yeah. But uh, please, uh, 
so this is the end of this slide. So if you want to ask questions, please do. Yeah, so I thought this was really cool. The only thing I was wondering about is, so on your slide before you had shown why you guys had chosen K equals two, and that was the best solution across all of the ages, right? And I was wondering if you thought that a different number of like event clusters might be better for like, if that could change across age as well. Does that make sense? Uh, um, that, that, that is a good question. We haven't tested that. Uh, we wanted to have uh, the number of K consistent across all age groups, but um, we haven't investigated that, but that is a good question. Yeah, no worries. I was just curious. Um, also, I'm going to try and change this preset so you can see the people in the room. I think I forgot oh, thank to you. that before. Yeah. That might be more pleasant than looking at yourself presenting on the screen. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Okay. And uh, another finding was that event patterns like static FC are modular. Here uh, on the left spot is the green dots, which are the modularity of uh, modularities of static, conventional, functional connectivity matrices. Uh, the purple dots are for non-events, and the blue and orange dots are for C1 and C2. And uh, these results are also in uh, al are aligned with previous literature suggesting that the modularity of functional connectivity decreases with age. And compared to the modularity of full brain FC, uh, C1 and C2 are more modular than FC, whereas non-events were less modular than FC. Next, uh, when we used modularity maximization, we identified four modules in C1 and two modules in C2. And we can also see how these modules align compared to the previous result of the first principal, compo first principal components in the previous slide. So, there were three questions that I wanted to ask at the beginning, which is how do events change with age? And another question that I wanted to ask was uh, how do events relate to structural connectivity? And uh, here I wanted to ask how events and structural connectivity derived measures of interregional communication change with age. And so uh, with this approach, we could ask questions like what structurally derived communication measure best predicts functional connectivity, or in this case, events. Uh, here we followed the analytic approaches by Fernand Zamani, Esfalani, and others in 2022. And one of the uh, main problems that is, is, is quite trivial, but uh, we often face is that functional connectivity matrices are fully connected and signed. And whereas structural connectivity matrices are very sparse, and binarized or positively weighted. And uh, so a direct comparison between the two modalities are can be tricky. And uh, what we could do is based on the structural connectivity matrix, uh, we can apply, uh, we can transform these sparse SC matrices into a fully weighted matrix uh, that incorporates various communication policies. And for instance, this is a very crude uh, measure, but for instance, Euclid, uh, the far right black figure here, the Euclidean distance. Uh, for instance, we could uh, create uh, a Euclidean distance matrix based on using the nodal distance information. And now using the nodal distance, the physical distance information, we can calculate a Euclidean distance matrix, which is fully connected and readily comparable to functional connectivity. Now, uh, using a subject's SC matrix, we calculated 34 different SC-derived communication matrices as the 2022 paper. And with functional data, calculated a subject's C1 and C2 matrices. We then descored each matrix, respectively, and calculated the variance explained by each measure per subject. Uh, we could then average the variance explained across all subjects to create a representative relationship matrix between SC-derived communication measures with C1 and C2. And uh, because we like brain plots, uh, we also plotted the maximum variance explained for each node 
or in this case, it would be uh, the maximum value for um, each column on the right. And just by visual inspection, we could see that C1 and C2 uh, correspond to SC-derived communication measures differently in the human brain. Next, we wanted to see whether SC SC event relationships change with age. And in both C1 and C2, we found that the amount of explained variance by SC-derived measures correlate with age. For C1, significant changes correlated with age were associated in the control C, uh, dorsal attention B, the SVA, SVN uh, A network, the somatomotor B, and the visual peripheral areas. And for C2, significant changes correlated with age were largely associated in the central and peripheral visual areas. Also, in both C1 and C2, we wanted to find the most representative communication measure so we could create a nice brain plot, of course. And uh, the communication measure that produced the most similar results across all 34 measures were uh, binarized cosine similarity which also shows how C1 has various regions of the age-related correlations, which uh, include uh, positive correlations and negative correlations, whereas uh, for C2, the age-related age correlations were largely negative, and uh, these negative correlations large, largely focused in the visual areas. Also, here is the difference in variance explained from the first age group compared to the other age groups. You can visually see, so uh, for instance, in the visual peripheral areas, you could see how um, the uh, average explained variance uh, increases, the, the difference increases from the first age group with age. You can see the incremental changes just, visual, by, just by visual inspection. And uh, this is one of our last uh, sections. So I, I had three questions in mind. One was, uh, how do events change with age? And the second was, how do events and structural connectivity uh, relate? And how do their relationships change with age? And the thir third question that I wanted to answer was, um, can events be proven useful for predicting phenotypes? And here, uh, to answer this question, the last question here was to use connectome-based predictive modeling by Shen and colleagues in 2017 to predict phenotypes using uh, event frames. And the method is quite simple. Uh, so what you do is take the connectivity matrix, and in this case, you would take a subject C1 and C1 or C2 matrix and take the subject's behavioral measure of interest. And basically, you would correlate each edge in the, func in the connectivity matrix with the behavioral measure. And then uh, you can select only the most significantly correlated edges in the matrix using a statistical threshold. And for each subject, you can sum up the selected edges and try to fit a linear model from the brain behavior relationship. And you can also do this by uh, applying the model to new novel subjects in the data set by using K-folds validation. And so uh, when we applied this method to our data, uh, we these are four different scores of achievement or intelligence. And uh, we reported, we found that event frames create better phenotypic predictions than non-event frames. Um, but I do note that when we use the typical functional connectivity matrix, the correlation coefficients for these uh, four different scores were around 0.6 to 0.8 for these measures. So we are not, the event frames are not outperforming the static FC. And that is not what we were trying, we, we did not even expect that. And um, but the point is that the amount of data we are using here is only 0.1 to 1% of the entire time series data. And uh, 
Also, these results suggest that different event patterns can better predict different phenotypes. Uh, for, for instance, C1 has a 0.46 correlation between the observed and predicted Wyatt scores, whereas C2 showed only 0.35 correlation. So uh, the predictive, uh, predictive value is, uh, is not limited to like a, so they are not both very uh, equally well predicting of a particular uh, phenotype. They have different utilities. And also across four tests, C1 had higher correlation than the C2 events suggesting that the events that are atypical or do not resemble functional connectivity or less resemble functional connectivity hold interesting information. And uh, we are also planning to regress out factors such as age and motion from these results, which may increase the prediction power of event frames. And that said, while the, in these uh, four different measures, which are largely related to intelligence or achievement, um, the results from uh, different phenotypes or such as like social interactions or uh, depression, for instance, uh, we have data for that for the NKI data, data set. Um, in, in those data, uh, C2 might perform better. And so we need to do further analyses on the different type, different categories of phenotypes and see how the event patterns perform. And uh, also, I did not add the figure here, which we are thinking of adding as a supplementary figure, is that the subject identifiability or how similar my scans are to myself than to others uh, is uh, was higher for uh, C2s than C1s. And of course, C2s and C1s outperform the results of non-events. So uh, in, in all, um, the, the utility of C1 and C2 really depend on the question that we have in mind, is what I wanted to say here. And so we have talked about a lot of different things, but this is the uh, recap of the different results and the takeaways of the talk today. And so for one, uh, our results have demonstrated that edge time series from resting state fMRI data have events which can be categorized in, into distinct patterns. Uh, for one, C2s were found to be event patterns that are very similar to typical FC, and C1 may be events that are divergent from typical FC. And we have also found that such events change with age, and their frequencies also change with age. The frequency of FC resembling C2 events significantly increased with age, whereas the less resemblant C1 events decreased. This is uh, just pure speculation, but such events and event pattern frequency may underlie a solidification or preservation process of FC, aiming to keep its resemblance to itself more than creating divergent event patterns. Third, uh, we have also found that events are modular. And while the results haven't been shown here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, events were found to be more identifiable than non-events, which suggests that they hold more. Uh, C1 and C2s have a subject-specific information much more than non-events, uh, which also leads to the fifth question in analyses uh, that the event frames may provide enhanced phenotype prediction results. And uh, as the fourth result, we have shown that such patterns and how they couple with different structural connectivity derived communication measures change with age. In both C1 and C2, the explained variance from structural connectivity derived measures decreased with age in the visual areas. That was common for both C1 and C2. Uh, however, the results from other regions were more heterogeneous, and uh, these results suggest that the relationship between events and structural connectivity is heterogeneous and it's dependent on the event type. And
And uh, lastly, we demonstrated that events improve phenotype predictions compared to non-events. Uh, and this is only using as little as 0.1 and maximally up to 1% of temporal information used in creating functional connectivity matrices. Also, uh, these results demonstrate that different event patterns can be useful for predicting different phenotypes, which were there, uh, warrants uh, further investigation uh, to the available NKI phenotype data that we have in hand. And uh, the enhanced phenotype predictions using events were found across four different measures of achievements and intelligence. So uh, we are very interested in finding relationships outside of these um, very similarly, these measures that measure very similar things. And yeah, that's what we are interested in doing next. Uh, but uh, thank you for your attention and the opportunity to pre present our latest findings. Uh, these are my collaborators, Jake Tanner, Josh Vaskowitz, and Rick Betzel. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, okay, anyone want to come up with a question? All right, a uh, great talk. I find these, um, these open frames and patterns are so intriguing sort of phenomenon that I should try to make my head around a little bit. But I'm curious, um, with your study with the changes over age, I'm curious if you would predict if you did, say, a longitudinal study and you started with you know younger people, you know, young adults between you know 20 years of age, and then you measured them again when they're you know much older, you know, 50 or 60. Do you think their event patterns would be more similar within themselves, so the same person between two time points, or more similar across their cohort, so amongst their 20-year-olds and within their, their more 60-year-olds? That is a really good question, and I don't have a good answer for that. And I, I, I'm not a, very aware of a data set that spans a big age distance that is longitudinal, um, but um, I, um, I, 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 I would be curious about that um, because there are um, very large age-related changes in the event patterns. I am just going to throw this out there that uh, cohorts might be more similar, but that's just to give you an answer, and that has not been tested out yet. Thank you. Great talk. Like, even though I have no, uh, not very much prior knowledge on this, but uh, it does like help me like uh, extract some of the knowledge about this collective uh, yourself. And uh, I'm just a little uh, curious whether uh, you have like tried to build because uh, you mentioned that event level over age, and uh, whether you have used the age as maybe like a learning factor to uh, put in like. Uh, for phenotype uh, predictions as well. I don't know. Uh, that... I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, could you yeah. speak up a bit louder? I, mean, I can't really. Oh, sorry. Uh, can, can you hear me right now? Yes, it's much better. Thank you. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, so, so I'm just a little wondering have you ever. Uh, ever done any study like try to like put uh, age as a predictor like into the phenotype prediction does it like change much or, or does it help a lot i don't know if that makes sense to you so um that's a really good question and uh, we are planning to do that next so uh we're still in the figure making and writing process of this project right now um but uh the next step that we want to do is uh try to regress out effects of like brain volume, age, motion from the data to perhaps enhance the predictive power of the event patterns. Um, but, we, but we are planning to do that and we haven't done that yet. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Um, okay, so Joe, I had one more question or maybe suggestion, I'm not sure, um, but it went back to the project where you were looking at structural connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and you had mentioned that like one of the difficulties with relating structural connectivity to functional is that structural is binarized and then also sparse. And I was wondering if you guys had tried or thought about using like a probabilistic tractography instead so that you have like mm -hmm. probabilities of connections because then it wouldn't be binarized, like if that would also work or if it's different than what you're trying to look at. So I guess that is, um, as you mentioned, to create a fully connected SD matrix, um, that would be a good approach uh, using probabilistic tractography. Um, but I guess the, I guess this is a slightly different take in that mm -hmm. we could uh, derive we can add in communication policies from a graph from a graph theoretical approach. Mm -hmm. So this is like um, like mean first passage time or uh, cosine distance or uh, uh, path length, uh, communicability. So uh, so this is adding that graph theoretical flavor to the SC matrix that we have. And so oh, okay, it, yeah. So it is slightly different. Mm -hmm. But we could also do that, um, just using yeah. the structural connectivity matrix as is and see how they relate to events, and which we haven't done, but that would be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I was missing the point where, like, what you, like, you guys, will, by using these other metrics, you were able to take an aspect of graph theory and apply that to the connectivity, not just, like, fix the sparse part. Um, so that makes yes, sense. Yes, yes. Cool. But I guess I highlighted, highlighted that part a bit more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'm just now starting to care or learn about structural connectivity. So I was like, hmm, maybe I've learned something. Uh, okay, great. Any final questions you guys have? Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.